Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, May 9th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We got an interesting post today from Renato of Morpheus Labs, who is writing about his investigation into a P2P botnet. This botnet, which was mostly comprised of Unify routers and Raspberry Pis, among a number of other Linux systems like that, did use a P2P system to communicate with each other, which enabled Renato to actually look into the size of the botnet by just polling nodes that connected to him for their neighbor list and then essentially just ask those neighbors for their neighbor list which resulted in about 5,000 different infected systems by this particular botnet. Interesting write-up about the command control infrastructure of this botnet, the use of Excel certificates in certain cases for authentication is also kind of interesting. He also lists a number of indicators of compromise that you can use to find infected systems in your network. Now, the main infection vector here appears to be weak passwords, just like that. So often before I mentioned Unify, the Unify routers often are configured with a default UBNT account and password. Then there is also Raspberry Pis. Now in the past, Raspberry Pis came with SSH enabled and a default password of Raspberry. More recent versions of the Raspbian operating system actually no longer enable SSH by default. You have to specifically enable it after you create the SD card. But typically these botnets aren't very picky. They take any Linux system or Unix system they can find. In this case, as we have seen before, the binary that's being uploaded comes in various versions for different architectures. And if you downloaded Handbrake, the popular video conversion utility for the Mac last week, you may want to double check what you actually received because at least one of the mirrors being used by Handbrake was compromised and mal malware was added to the download. Yet another reason why you should always check checksums before you install software or verify digital signatures. And today on Monday, Microsoft fixed a critical vulnerability in its malware protection engine. This is the malware scanner that's pretty much built into all anti-malware products released by Microsoft, like for example, Microsoft Defender. The reason for this update is that due to the vulnerability being addressed by the update, it's possible for an attacker to send a malicious file to the user that once scanned by Microsoft's anti-malware engine will execute arbitrary code. There is no user interaction required. The only thing that would have to happen is for the user to receive the malicious file in an email or on a web page the user visits as soon as the anti-malware engine tries to scan the file, the exploit can be triggered. This was applied today on Monday, a day before Microsoft's patch Tuesday, in part also because it was just rolled out with a regular signature update for Microsoft's anti-malware engine. According to Microsoft, the exploitability is actually only two, so not super critical, not already exploited in the wild. You shouldn't actually have to do anything to apply the update. It will just be applied uh, with the new signature update. Tavis Ormandy also tweeted about this vulnerability on Friday, at least hinting of its existence. And quite a while ago, Apple introduced a keychain to OS X and iOS, which is Apple's uh, password wallet. Now, one of the interesting features there is that different devices that are connected to the same Apple account can synchronize passwords with each other. Apparently, the protocol being used here is OTR, off the record. You may have seen it in instant messenger applications. Overall, a pretty solid 
protocol, but as usual, the problem tends to be in the implementation of uh, these somewhat complex protocols. Recently, Apple fixed a vulnerability in this protocol, and we now have a blog post with more details as to what exactly was fixed here. The problem was error handling, and that's something that often gets people into trouble where um, verification fails and the result is not interpreted it correctly. In this case, if the actual signature wasn't long enough to include the actual HMAC, the error message being returned by that function does actually indicate that verification succeeded. And as a result, an attacker could have access to the user's keychain. Now, by default, they will not receive a copy of the keychain. They're now just another trusted device within that user's set of keychains. So they will only receive updates to the keychain. But the blog post also points out out a number of scenarios where uh, this access could be leveraged to get full access to the keychain, in particular if one of the items being transmitted would be the user's iCloud password. So if you haven't yet, uh, better update your OS X and iOS systems and overall there isn't really much you can do about this vulnerability. Two-factor authentication helps a little bit uh, with some of the exploit mechanisms, in particular those that would take over the iCloud account of the user. Well, uh, this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.